And then we will. Great. So good morning to everybody on the live stream. Good morning. So, yeah. I'll give, uh, I'll hand it over to Ajahn Brown. This is day two and uh, this session will be a Dhamma talk and followed by a nice guided meditation. So Ajahn Brown will lead. Welcome back. Yay. Again. Welcome and good morning everybody over in Europe and from good afternoon in Australia. So yesterday I started talking about uh, the basic part of meditation and also about the Samawayama, which sometimes people call right effort. In the realm of meditation, though, that too often people put way too much effort in. And because of that, yesterday, I just made a, a very strong point, which I make consistently, that when you're meditating, when you're relaxing, when you're resting, it's not the time when you put effort in. When you're relaxing, resting, when you're meditating, that's the time where you let go. It's right behind uh, Venerable Chanda there. Uh, that's right, yes, let go. <laughs> and But that doesn't mean that when you are working, that you let go. If, for example, you're driving me, uh, say, from London to Stroud or something, and then you say, oh, it's time to let go. And you take your hand off the steering wheel. You're going to kill me. And that is going to crash into something. That's not what we mean by letting go. The effort is when you really need to work to do something. Yeah, put effort in. You know, one thing about right effort, I'm talking about effort, effort now, in your daily life, there's something which I found that if the effort is actually to get something out of this for yourself. It's always to strange your energy. But if the effort is to give, to serve, to help others, you get an increase of energy, which is weird sometimes. I, I couldn't understand that at first when I was a young monk, but on this one evening, I hope I didn't give this simile last time, but one evening after the morning uh, service, I'm oh, sorry, we can't do morning service in the evening, after the evening chanting and meditation over in Thailand, there were these poor four monks who were making their robes. And there was really a lot of hard work from white cloth, they had to make the dye, get the water out of the well. And it was about three or four days continuous work, no sleep for those monks. And the rule was, that's what you had to do, you know, to actually, to get the privilege of ordaining, make your own stuff. So anyway, after a couple of nights, they had sort of slept. After the evening meeting, I went to the dying shed. And, and I, was, I was breaking the monastery rule because they were supposed to do it by themselves. And I said, now look, sort of, you now I, you know, can, I can know how to uh, make uh, the dye and make the robes. Why don't you just go and take a nap? And you get up at three o'clock in the morning when the bell goes, and I'll just look after the dyeing shed tonight. And I expected them to argue and to say, no, no, we've got to keep the rules. But they never even replied. They were off. <laughs> they disappeared. They ran away and had a, a you know, three or four hours sleep. And any one of you who's ever been without sleep, you you know how difficult it is, you know, to, you know, you almost, you're not really all there. So they took a sleep and I was doing the dying all night. Remember, I hadn't slept all day either. I was doing the dying and in the morning, three o'clock, the bell went and they came back shortly afterwards and said, thank you. But the point was, I was just so um, energized. And so I didn't want to make uh, anybody realize I'd broken the rules and help somebody. So I just went straight to the morning meeting, started meditating, and chanting and stuff. And you know, that was one of the times I had no sloth and torpor at all in the morning. Three o'clock in the morning, hadn't slept all night, and I was perfectly clear and full of energy and happiness. 
And that was weird. And so when I went on arms round, just after the morning meeting had finished and we cleaned up a bit, then I had all this energy all the time. And I asked the senior monk then, I said, I confess, I just broke the rule yesterday or last night. I helped some of the other monks so they could get a bit of a rest. It's not really bad breaking of the rule, it's just out of kindness. But the weird thing was that now I've got all this energy and I, I was so clear. And that monk told me, he said, yes, you can expect that because when you help other people selflessly, you finally get a boost of energy. And that was one of the first times I realized where the right effort in the sense you're doing something extra, but it's not for yourself. It is a letting go of your own comfort, your own sleep patterns, so you can <coughs> be of service to others. And to me, that was so important in life. You now we really put forth a lot of effort into whatever we're doing. And it's not really for us. If it's for others, that's fine. But when it's time for you, that's when you just sit there and do nothing. And you really relax. But part of that, the right effort, was also that time when this man came from Sydney to see me. This again is a lovely story. Again, it's a personal story because uh, he was an Aussie and he came to Perth to see me just to tell me this story. He said he was you know, reasonably successful as a young businessman, but he still has many things in his life he just wanted to clear up and add a little bit more spirituality and love and you know, kindness to his life. And that's when he heard of this monk Ajahn Chah in Thailand. And so he managed to take a three or four days off work. Well, he could do that because he was a boss. And fly over to Bangkok, and from Bangkok to Ubon, and from Ubon to get a taxi to Wat Ba Pong, where Ajahn Chah was. He was lucky that Ajahn Chah was there, but unlucky that when he saw Ajahn Chah uh, under his hut, this is about a year or two before Ajahn Chah stopped teaching, when he saw Ajahn Chah under his hut, there were so many people surrounding Ajahn Chah, there was no way that he could get close enough to ask his questions. He was just sitting on the outside for a couple of hours. And he soon realized there's no way that he could get Ajahn Chah's attention and ask his important questions. And so he got up, I think he did bow and he left. But he did realize his taxi wouldn't arrive for another hour. And that was a taxi to take him back to the airport to fly, you know, back to uh, Bangkok and then Bangkok to Sydney. And he realized that he might as well do something useful. So he picked up a broom. The other monks were sweeping the grounds. He picked up a broom and started sweeping. And somehow or other that caught Ajahn Chah's eye or he read his mind or something, because a few minutes after he picked up the broom and started sweeping, he felt a hand on his shoulder, and he turned around and that hand belonged to Ajahn Chah. And through an interpreter, Ajahn Chah told him, if you're going to, to sweep, give it everything you've got. And then Ajahn Chah left. It was a very, very brief teaching but he realized that that was powerful. So on the, um, the taxi ride to the airport and all the way from the airport to back to, uh, on the flights back to Sydney, he always remembered that teaching. If you're sweeping, give it everything you've got. And then he put that practice into his life. When he was at work, he gave work everything he'd got. When it was uh, going home, he didn't think of the work, he didn't think of his family, where he was going to. He just made sure that he was driving carefully you know, in the traffic. When he got home, he wasn't working, he was with his family. When he was eating, he was eating. He wasn't thinking about other things. When he was resting, he was resting. When sleeping, he gave sleep everything he had. When he was meditating on the weekend, he gave meditation everything he had. When he was playing golf or whatever he did, he played the game of golf, everything he had. He became a very, very successful man. And that's why he came to tell me, he said that changed his whole life, that simple teaching. It showed him how he could put forth effort into his life.
It wasn't sort of something he planned to do. It was just every time, whatever he was doing in his life, he gave it 100%. And the strange thing is, if you give 100% to your work, you'll find you have plenty of energy left for your family when you go home. Sometimes we worry, if I give everything I, I have to this talk right now, oh, I'm going to be exhausted later on. I won't have anything left you know, to share with others. It doesn't work that way. You have full effort right now, and you find you have full effort afterwards. That's actually how this mind works. And how the body doesn't work the same way, obviously. You do get tired out physically. But the mind, that's how it works. You give sleep everything you've got. So you don't worry about what you have to do tomorrow morning. You don't really worry about what happened beforehand. It's sleep time, so you can sleep everything you have. You don't uh, think about things in your bed so you can get a good night's rest. You become really efficient. And that's actually how we do this effort you know, when we are working. But there comes a time you know, when we have to learn how to rest. When we learn how to rest, that is where I mean we learn the art of doing nothing. Many people know how to do things. Oh, I've seen some people that's just so skillful with them in the uh, laying bricks or um, sewing or cleaning or fixing up problems on the internet or on the computers or whatever it is you do these days. They're brilliant at their work but they're hopeless at meditation. One of the reasons is because they try, they, they do the same thing. I work really hard, if I work really hard, I'm gonna get somewhere. I'm gonna achieve. And that's what I did in my academic career, getting all the way to Cambridge. You find afterwards there was something wrong with that. And what I used, I looked at other people who had gone further along that path than I had got. And you know, these were Nobel laureates. And this one of the people I met over there, he was, I don't think he'd mind me mentioning him. At least I hope not, but he's still alive. That was uh, Sir Roger Penrose. He was a fellow who did the maths, which uh, uh, from that he got out the idea of black holes. He was a black hole. You can't call it inventor, but discoverer. Brilliant mathematician. And I remember meeting him here in Perth. I got good connections. And he was like a wallflower. You couldn't have a conversation with him. You could converse with a, a whiteboard, write all his incredible theories, but anything had a partner. And he was almost impossible to talk with. He wasn't afraid of religion, he was just socially just not very well developed. And sometimes you really wondered, all that effort, if you can only manage to get that incredible effort and, and sharpness of intellect and put into something which is more useful in your life, amazing what you could do. And that's one of the reasons why I decided not to carry on with academia, but to uh, go over to town and become a monk. There's something more powerful in that because there I knew how to put forth effort into my life and built monasteries for goodness sake. But now I had to learn how to stop, how to let go, how to renounce, because all of that effort is always to get somewhere. And we're now to renounce so I can just be. And that was one of the most important tricks of meditation learning how you can work really hard, be very tired even, physically. And that's amazing stuff, honestly. Just how, even if you're very sick, one of the sickest times I've ever had was when I had scrub typhus. And I was in a third world hospital, it's probably fourth world, I reckon, over in northeast of Thailand. And I won't, I'll describe that so the, <laughs> the, the simplicity of that hospital. But about three or four weeks, I had this scrub typhus. And no one knew what it was because according, this is the trouble with knowledge. The knowledge said there is no scrub typhus 
in the northeast of Thailand at the time. We checked the health organizations. There's no scrub typhus there at all. Eventually, there was one smart doctor who said, well, look, these are all of these symptoms. It's like scrub typhus. It's not typhoid. They're similar, but not the same. And of course, he, got, he managed to talk the health department to setting some some uh, experts up from Bangkok and they did the test and of course it was scrub typhus. But men, the only reason why I and many other of the monks got it because we were not locals, we were Westerners. The locals had developed immunity from scrub typhus. That's why I never registered. The little mites, little bugs, which were in the forest, they were still there just waiting for monks like me to meditate in the forest instead of in the huts. And that's where we caught the scrub typhus. I mentioned that because that was a time as a young monk, uh, and probably the weakest I've ever been physically. It was really hard to stand and to go to the toilet. I always remember that the lucky monks were the monks who had the top, the, it's a, the old wards, six, about a dozen beds, six beds on either side. There's no nurse on duty in the evenings from six p.m. to 6 a.m., you are on your own. And I asked one of the monks, what happens if we you know, have a really serious um, health incident? So it's just unlucky karma, that's all. Imagine saying that for the national health system in the UK. <laughs> of course, people will be sued, to be inquiries and stuff, but that was just all they could do in those days. So anyway, so if then one day, about three or four weeks into my illness, absolutely zero energy to go to the toilet you only go once a day and you stand there as long as you possibly could because you didn't want to go there and make that great expedition twice so anyway what i did was just uh, i got so fed up one day it was actually it's weird because this was from not depression because you were just not healthy enough to be depressed if you know what i mean you're just sick the sickness the debilitating illness and lack of physical energy was the cause and no negativity. But what earth, why not meditate? And I remember that so clearly, the experience, because you know, I never expected anything. I thought, how on earth can you, you get any deep meditation with absolutely zero energy and enough energy to breathe and to keep alive, but not much more. But then you got into closed my eyes and started meditating. Fortunately, I, I knew there's no way of watching the breath because I was too weak for that. You couldn't control anything. So you just let go, let things be. And that was one of the most amazing experiences of my early monastic life. Just to see, just to get into a very, very deep meditation. Body disappeared, having a wonderful time inside. And the contrast between how I felt before and how you felt inside the meditation was just so amazing. And when you came out of the meditation, you felt so happy. Still had the sickness, at least you were still weak. I wish I'd have known better because probably, probably, you know, that that was probably when the fever broke during the deep meditation. But I remember afterwards looking at my posture. And if you have seen my posture at the time, I've never seen anything like that in any book on meditation. Legs were all over the place, arms were all over the place. I was laying down, but not on my back, you know, half on my back, half on the side, legs and arms all over the place. But the body was comfortable. That's how I wanted it to be. You go into this incredible deep meditation. And that told me a lot about effort. The effort was to let things go, to let things be, and to give 100% into letting things be, not wanting anything in the whole world. We tried wanting for three or four weeks, trying to get out of this aching, painy, heaty uh, scrub typhus. But now we gave up. We get into deep meditations. And those experiences are fantastic. And that's one of the reasons why I keep on this. Right effort is basically right renunciation or right guard, even guarding. Renunciation, right letting go. Making sure your mind is, is pure of all these hindrances. 
And the main hindrances are wanting, wanting this, wanting that, or trying to get rid of things. And this craving, this second noble truth is a problem. So anyway, little by little, we learn how to let go of these things. So when you do learn to let go of these things, you find that is the main part of meditation. You sit down or you lay down or if you're in a hospital. Some people say, well, how can you meditate when you're in hospital with a deep sickness? I say, you can. I've done it. And I mentioned that and it's fantastic. But how do you actually do it? You don't do it. That's the point. You have enough mindfulness, not super mindfulness. I must admit at that time. Super mindfulness afterwards, but while that's happening, all you're doing there is just being in this very moment. You're too tired to worry about the future. The future doesn't look good at all. In the past three weeks, well, we don't want to think about that. So you are in this moment. There's a bit of peace there. And you stay with that peace. You go into the silence. You can't do anything and force it. You just let things be because you're too weak to do anything else. And you have the kindness. That's something which was trained into you by someone like an Ajahn Chah. And so all of the things which I'd read about Buddhism, that's what really inspired me about the teachings. It's kind, 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 straight away. Sometimes people don't practice enough kindness, but that to me was some of the essence of the Buddha's teachings. And so when you have that kindness, and you have that mindfulness, you just naturally go inside. And as you go inside, you go deeper and deeper inside, and wow, what you experience is mind-blowing. And it's also just, often I, I think I always remember to you the first time I had a deep meditation, and you came out afterwards, and sometimes I thought my first reaction was, why hasn't anybody told me about this before? Maybe it's because of that reaction, even though it was over 50 years ago, that even now I always think that I need to tell people about this. They're just telling you what's possible. Doesn't mean you try, because trying is not the right way. You know that this is what happens when you really let go to the max. I mentioned to the max because sometimes by letting go is almost the opposite of effort. So a lot of times people, because they're used to actually putting forth effort, having a goal and trying to achieve it, having bucket lists, things they tick off, get all these things done before they die. I think that's a stupid thing to, to do. That's just more craving, more tension in your, I've got no bucket lists. I've got no things I need to tick off. You just let go of things. And you let go of things, it's much, much, much more peaceful. I often tell people, what was it, just a few years ago, of I was invited to Las Vegas. I went to Las Vegas some years ago. I can't tell you what I did there because you all know that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> Sorry, I can't resist this telling joke, which is who I am. <laughs> but I was just teaching meditation and uh, to a lovely, uh, a lovely uh, Sri Lankan doctor who just wanted to invite me there to actually to say gratitude for helping her cope with the loss of her brother, which really devastated her for a while. But anyway, she invited me. Oh, there's an extra day. Would you like to go to see the Grand Canyon? I said, no. She said, have you seen it before? I said, no. And she couldn't believe that somebody was so close that the Grand Canyon had the time and the free sort of trip to go and see it. And I said, no. I said, why? It's just a hole in the ground. It's just a river. Why do you want to see all these things? And instead of wanting, I said, I'd rather honestly to stay in a nice quiet place and just meditate, close my eyes and be peaceful. Because that was really important to me. The peace was more important than seeing what other people in the world say is a fantastic experience to see the Grand Canyon. To me, it's much better to see the beautiful peace and stillness inside the heart. I was being honest. 
So anyway, those sorts of things tell you just how the right effort will only make humans more worldly. It's okay to do that as you know, you're, what you have to do to pay the bills, look after your family, and to build monasteries and build a, a nice place for Venerable Chanda. There's, you know how much hard effort that is, but sometimes you just let it go and just have a nice retreat. And just let it all fall apart and it will all sort of come back together again afterwards. I know that I've seen that happen too many times. What we do is just to learn this is more important to spend just an hour, a couple of hours doing nothing, no goals, nothing to aim for, nothing to aspire for, just being here. Really being here 100%. Remember, whatever you're doing, give it 100%. So give doing nothing 100%. It's what I always say when I say relax to the max. Sometimes, again, I tell too many jokes, I'll probably admit that's a fault of mine. But nevertheless, relax to the max is not a joke. It's not some brand name. It's something which is really deep and very true. If you're going to do it, do it 100%. So you sit down and you close your eyes. You've got to relax a lot, the body. And okay, I say I sweep the body, that's doing something. Yes, okay, fair enough. But then I do that when I get any sort of part of the body which is tense. That's where I just let go. I've learned how to do that for so many years. You focus on something and then you give it, how do you let go? Give it kindness. Kindness in the sense of opening the door of your heart is a way of letting go. Open the door of your heart, whatever is happening right now, whoever you are, come in. I'm not going to judge you before I open the door of your, my heart. I'm not going to make a contract with you. I'll open the door of my heart if you do this or if you do that. Sometimes that's not loving kindness. That's like business. Instead, it's just totally just free. Totally letting go. Opening the door of your heart that way. And it's a beautiful thing which happens, especially when you do that to whatever, however you're feeling. Focus on the spot which is aching, which is irritating, which is in pain. It's called letting go. One of the reasons why that you, know, you did the kindfulness word, mindfulness and kindness, it's not just being aware, it's being aware and letting go. And say, well, letting go, that's doing something. So call it kindness. Kindfulness. It is. Amazing, when you do that to your own body, it gives you a little bit more trust because you're more aware of your body than you are of your mind and emotional states to begin with. Later on, you become very aware of your emotional states as well, but with your body, it is connected to the emotional states. And so much fear creates so much illness. And so what we do, we learn how to lessen the illness by abandoning the fear. We react positively to whatever we're experiencing. And even to things like cancer. For some reason, I am very popular with our local cancer group. Every year I go there and they come here to Bodhinyana Monastery. We've been doing that for the last 35 years, <laughs> going and coming there. And I always remember just when, when they, they built their new center, it was the uh, premier of Western Australia. He lived you know, not far away from the Cancer Support Association. So he used you know, his influence to get this funding for a huge new center for them. And when we had the opening ceremony for that, the two VIPs who came there to open the place up was our local premier, that was Colin Barnett, his name was, and me. I said, what the heck am I doing here? You know, where are the Catholics, the Christians or whatever? They said, no, no, you're the one who's helped us the most. So that's why they invited me. That was a great honor. It wasn't just an honor, it was just somehow or other, I'd been doing something which was working. And what you were doing there, teaching people, encouraging them, suggesting to them, 
if you've got some irritation in your body somewhere, it can be a, a tumor growing or something. How about just not just radiating it with this, uh, or taking chemicals and radiating it with sort of, I forget what they radiate it with anyway, but how about just radiating it with your kindness? Being with it. The door of my heart is open to you, Chuma. Come in. You can stay if you wish. It's beautiful peace and positive attitude towards things. And I mention that because this doctor I knew, she was a head, she was an oncologist. She was over in of Malaysia. And you know, she's a very, very successful um, oncologist about to retire. I love people about to retire. I, I don't get sort of, um, jealous of them, I must admit, because <laughs> I like doing my work. But anyway, that she said that she knows, she can tell when a person comes into her consulting rooms who is going to die and who's going to survive with about 80 or 90% accuracy. Not on their CT scans or you know, how many tumors they have or where they have them. She said the one thing which tells her with 90% accuracy is just their attitude, the attitude to their disease. And she was an honest person and she would not lie to a monk, not so that sort of person in, uh, in the Buddhist community in uh, Malaysia. She was honest. And I took that on board. And even now, if I see anything in my own body, I don't mean it's a tumor, it's a cancer, it's whatever. You just look at some irritation there somewhere. You focus on it with kindness. And you'll have this wonderful effort of letting it be, welcoming it. Thank you for coming in. Seriously, no fear, no control. What that does is relaxes that part of the body. You can feel it opening up. You can feel it, everything getting sort of loose and warm and kind. Just like, I'm sure other people have these memories too. You know, my family were poor. My father died when I was only 16. He was in hospital many times before that. And in council flats, not a council house, flats, which is very, very small. But so for a lot of times in the holidays, we're going out into the local park or on the street, around the back, playing football, soccer. And when you're playing football, you fell over many times. And so many times you fell over and you cut yourself and scraped the skin off your knees. And I remember the scabs on my knees, which you got used to. That was you know, part of life, having scabs on your knees when you are playing football. And every time I really sort of hurt myself, you'd run to your mum. And all she'd ever do was actually kneel down and kiss the wound. At the time, I didn't know any better. When she did science, I wondered how that worked. Uh, open mouth with all of those germs and bugs you know, on an open wound. I thought, oh, how come I sort of didn't get infected? I never did. But also after she gave me that kindness, no lack of fear, it was my mum. When you had a lack of fear and kindness, the pain went away. And sometimes you put a plaster on, which didn't cover the whole thing. It usually came off after five minutes and the next tackle you did playing soccer but it never ever got infected, it always healed. And I remember that, especially how the pain went away as soon as there was some kindness. And you know, these days my mother passed away quite a few years ago. And anyway, she wouldn't be allowed to you know, kiss a wound on me or anything else at this time of my life. But I don't need that because I just look at my body. We have a wound sort of on the heel of your your foot, or you may have cut your, your finger. What do you do? You just look at it. And you give it all this incredible kindness. You've been doing this for years. You don't want anything. You're just caring. Not, not having any aspirations, any sort of business dealings. You're just caring. And the pain just, just starts to vanish and vanish and vanish and vanish. 
gets less and less and it goes really quickly. And that surprises me sometimes, but it works. How does it work? It's because you're understanding just what letting go really means. You're practicing it 100%. People who say, oh, I'm going to let go, let go, let go, let go. It's not working. Let go, let go. It doesn't work. What you're doing is you're saying, let go, I want it to go. So again, it's a business deal, it's a contract. It never works that way. Real kindness, real love, real matter. It doesn't demand anything from anybody. It just wants to be and learn and grow. And that's actually how you meditate. So sometimes you've got pain in the body somewhere or other. Okay, you know, try and care for your body. Don't just be stupid and just sit on broken glass in the sun. So, uh, do, you, do you have any sun in Europe right now? <laughs> in December? You don't go out and sit in the snow. That's like probably better. I mean, with hardly any clothes on and think that that's being a good Buddhist and really being tough. And no, you look after the body. But if you've got these aches and pains anywhere, you just go right into them. That simile of the lotus flower, right into it, right into the middle of it, into the middle of the middle of the middle of the middle. You just tell your mind to do that and off it goes. You don't have to keep telling the mind again and again every second. You're not doing it, you're not doing it. Give it time, be patient. And the mind goes into some incredibly deep states of mind. Now you see there that I haven't told you, do this first of all, just you know, you get your body nice and comfortable. Then you sit in this position and then you close your eyes and then you ask yourself, am I peaceful? How peaceful? And then you go and watch the silence and then you want to go and watch the, the um, what else do you do? <laughs> the present moment. Then you go and watch the breath. Then you just watch the long breath, the short breath, and then you go and see the whole body of the breath. And then you see the joyful breath. And then you see, and that is a very good description. It comes from the Buddha. But for real life, Sometimes we just go in and we can see all those stages. It's like seeing the stages of going from, say, um, London to Manchester or London to Germany on an aircraft or on a train. You pass by many of these landmarks, but sometimes you're just so peaceful, you don't notice those landmarks. You go deep into things like limiters. There's beautiful lights in the mind. They're saying, well, they're here. And you know that once they're here, you no need to try and disturb them, no need to try and capture them and put them in a cage. That doesn't work at all. Just enjoy them and make peace with them. If they come, they come. If they go, they go. But that sort of type of attitude, the kindfulness, then your meditation takes off in weird and wonderful ways. It's always the same. You let go and things disappear. That's one of the reasons why one of the best books on meditation, which has got my name on it, is called The Art of Disappearing. And that was uh, compiled and composed, compiled and edited by Ajahn Bhumali. And that was wonderful because the, the title is just brilliant, The Art of Disappearing. You vanish in meditation. You don't do it. You get out of the way and let it happen. That's the most scary part of it. You can't take any, any credit for it. You can only spoil it, get involved and disturb it. When you learn how to let go, you're just a passenger on this incredible journey going inwards. And all these things which you've read about in the suttas, all these things you've heard about from monks like myself or Ayachanda, all these things which you know you, you now you understand, it becomes personal direct experience. And they're fantastic things. And it's well worth spending the time just learning of this. You can practice, practice, practice many, many times. 
He can fail, fail, fail many times, but he's not a real failure. There's no such thing as a bad meditation. You keep learning. And hopefully you'll notice the more you let go, the more you do nothing, the easier it becomes. And that's one of the reasons why we do things like guided meditations. In other words, I do the work for you. You do nothing. You just listen and let it happen. It's a brilliant idea, guided meditations, simply because you go much deeper because you feel comfortable not doing anything. I'm sort of doing things for you. That way, the mind gets more and more peaceful, more and more still, until you get to a place where you just let go, let the mind take over. In other words, just let peace and stillness carry on. You may notice some of those landmarks, like the breath, the beautiful breath, or usually these days the delightful breath, I call it. You notice things like limiters, beautiful lights in the mind. There's no need to get excited or get afraid. You know the meditation is going to finish. Now when I say to it, now open your eyes, close to the end of the meditation. So you're safe. It's like you've got somebody with you, it's me. And little by little, you find it's pretty easy to do. You have a wonderful time. Of course, that's why I teach. Every now and again, someone who's been meditating for years gets a nice meditation. Imagine how happy that makes me feel. Who knows? That could be you. So, <laughs> that's a double talk, starting off with. And now we do the guided meditation after a toilet break. If anyone wants a toilet break, I think a lot of people are just pretty quiet and peaceful. But anyway, toilet break if you need one. Okay, there it is. Want to go to the loo to deposit, make a deposit? <laughs> and then after five minutes, we can start with a guided meditation. Most people who have lots of questions, fine, you can ask the questions, but not now. They'll be answered later. Sometimes there are no end of questions, Ajahn. Ah, interesting comment. No end of questions. Actually, there is an end of questions, but those questions don't, don't end with answers. That's a nice thing to know. You never finish a question list by uh, giving answers, even if they're profound and accurate answers. <coughs> where questions end, where they finish, is when one is so peaceful one doesn't need answers anymore. The peace and the tranquility and the sense of satisfaction. You know, you don't need answers because you see the reality. When you find the treasure, you don't need the maps. So that's one of the things we've seen. Some, some people are always asking questions, one after the other, after the other, after the other. I think they're important. But their mind isn't still. So mind isn't still, that's why there'll always be more questions. I always like to think the thoughts and the questions, they're just like the waves on the surface of the lake. And the more questions you have, usually you find them just the more waves you have in your mind. And when you start to calm down, you still, questions tend to disappear. And still you're peaceful, you don't need answers. You can see the reflection of the full moon in the stillness of the water with no distortion, no more questions. But anyway, until that time, we have questions and give answers. Sometimes good, good uh, answers, sometimes funny answers. Sometimes what the Buddha did was no answers. That was really amazing, just even sit there. So what's the answer? Keep quiet. 
it's a good question, gets a good answer. It's a silly question. <laughs> it gets silly answers. <laughs> But also sometimes the answers, the questions are good to ask ourselves, aren't they? Like a lot yeah. of the questions can actually be um, um, sort of investigations that we can explore through our own experience. Yeah, yeah. That, that experience gets so still till there's no experience left. And then <laughs> there's no questions. We're not trying to just to be stupid. We're just learning how to find the, the end of all questions. Not through answers, not through being intelligent. That's the other great thing. It's one of the, the lay people the other day, he told me that I had this story of this monk's, his brother was fully aligned, but this monk, just he just couldn't learn anything. And said, what, um, uh, this, I think his brother, Gave him uh, just a rag and says, Keep on wiping the rag. <laughs> That's Chula Pantra, I think. Keep on wiping the rag. And he kept on wiping the rag until the rag got so dirty. And that was enough for him to notice the more you use something, the more it's going to get dirty and get broken and vanish and disappear. And so his craving for things in this world started to just lessen and lessen, lessen, lessen. Why have anything? It all just is anicca, subject to dissolution, fading away. Because of that, eventually, he became another arahat. That's all he knew, and that's all he practiced. Simple, not intellectual. That was pretty neat. And this lay person who realized the power of that, that little story. Anyway. Have we all lessened uh, uh, our pressure in our bladder? I hope. Should give another minute. Yeah, good look, quite settled. Okay. <laughs> you all there? Okay, now they're all here. Now let's disappear. <laughs> the art of disappearing. <laughs> So I'm going to sit a bit straighter, get into a nice posture. If you have typhus fever, you can lay in your bed like I did. Legs all over the place as long as you're comfortable. Close your eyes. Hmm. With your eyes closed. Bring awareness to your body. I'm going to adjust my posture. And get it the best you possibly can, which is not going to be perfect. It gets to be good enough. It's good enough. I'm aware of it, I can always make it better. So I start with my feet. Again, most of the time I meditate on the floor, on a cushion, but now I'm meditating in a chair, in an office chair. Good enough. My feet. I prefer my feet flat on the floor. Again, it's a warm climate up here, so I've got no socks on. I, I really enjoy the feeling, getting to be sensitive with my skin on this little mat. It's just a, a towel which is folded up on the floor. It's just very delightful. At the same time, I make sure my, my legs are comfortable enough. They're not going to cause aches and pains later on. And I adjust, I fidget. This is the time for fidgeting. It's not just aimless fidgeting. I'm always aware. 
And what I am doing is cultivating kindness to my body. Just say, I care about you, eggs. I'm not going to make you totally comfortable because that's impossible. But I'm trying to improve your state of comfort. And what's my legs and calves and knees and thighs are reasonably comfortable. And then I go to my butt. Making sure all that's nice and loose, easy. Then go up to my back. This time of my life, I like the straight back, little curve in the back, the pretty sort of straight up. If I notice any, any tightness anywhere, I make sure I loosen it. I let it go, let it be. Loosening any things which are tight, like my robes over one shoulder. And experiencing the sensations in my shoulders. This is just an exercise, don't follow it, it just it tells you roughly how to relax. Let's imagine that these muscles are being pulled on each side, stretched, it's under tension. Of course, that's gonna ache in a while. So I just imagine, I used to imagine these little monsters or demons, little things inside my body, just pulling those muscles apart. I tell them, let go, so they stop pulling. It's only imagination, but it helps me to let go of the tension in my shoulder muscles. They get really relaxed. They feel good. So the muscles don't get tense during your meditation. Down my arms, making sure they're okay. Oh dear. I don't know why this. I thought I'd just uh, paid a bit more attention to my hands, but I didn't. So I'm going to do that now, making sure that the, the hands are nice and comfortable. It's amazing how you've done it so many times, but sometimes you still forget. You pass over things. Whereas my hands and my uh, fingers are all in a good position. I didn't go too much through my front of my body. If, you, if anything's happening over there, just go there. Focus in with kindness. And hopefully you get the feedback that that part of your body is opening up, relaxing, being at ease. You're allowing the body to heal itself. <laughs> so many Illnesses and disease come from tension, fear, anxiety. Makes your body feel tight and so things don't go there to do their job of keeping it healthy. Makes you really loose and free. It feels good. And again, go up to my, my neck. Still got a slight bit of hay fever. There's heavy winds this morning that blows all the pollen all over the place. Winds have stopped this afternoon. So the hay fever is just not here right now for me. Nevertheless, I check and be kind. My poor throat has to do so much talking. And I go to the front of my face. All those muscles. I can feel them. And I loosen them, relax them. Muscles around the eyes. 
pretty loose. Their eyelids are closed, but they're not slammed down shut. There's no fear in my posture. And the nose, the mouth. Everything is loose and light. I know it's that way because it feels relaxed. And when it feels relaxed, it soon brings up a feeling of, for want of a better word, pleasure. The joy of relaxation. I see the whole body now, feel it from toes, to the knees, the thighs, and the back and the, the head. So no, don't try, but it's like you see it all together. A body at peace, relaxed to the max. Feel a little itch on the top of my head and my cheek, but no need to scratch that, they'll just make more itches. So there's some things you just ignore, you let it be. And as soon as it vanishes, the whole body feels peaceful and joyful. And it's the joy which you can perceive, which makes it easy to stay here. It's a pleasant place to be, especially for what you were doing beforehand, always moving around, doing things, going from one place to another. This is an effortless peace. So see you. And being able to perceive the joy in this moment also enables you to be in the present moment. If it's pleasant here, then you stay here. And in this moment, body relaxing. After a while, the body disappears. It's like it's nothing to do with it anymore. It's at ease. Like a child you love is in bed, not fast asleep. You can go and do something else, like some meditation, for example. Or your car, all locked up in the garage, all safe. You can leave it alone. Live around your body. No fear. As you go inside the mind. But always have the perception of going inwards. Not onwards, but inwards. Your mind now is helpful, it's skillful to notice how peaceful you are. This peace is an important aspect of the mind. The mind is not thought. The thoughts are disturbances of the mind. Peace is a deeper aspect of your mind. So if you look for how peaceful you are, you're beginning to become mindful of your mind. And the kindness is how can it be more peaceful? What disturbs you? Your mind. What disturbs your mind? What pacifies your mind? And simple things like present moment awareness. Don't know what you have to do afterwards, but right now, it's where your future is being made. Right now is the only time you have. The past, whatever happened, it's gone. 
you learn from the present much, much more than you ever learned from the past. Just encouraging you to stay here in this moment. That makes you more peaceful. The other thing which makes you more peaceful is stopping this internal conversation, talking to yourself. Instead, listen to me instead. Listen to this moment. Listen to your mind. Because in the silence, the peace starts to grow. Becomes more powerful. Being aware without trying to describe what it feels like. Not noting and saying any words. But just knowing. Just knowing this. And try not to measure it, compare it to anything. That will just take you back into the past. As it is right now. Peaceful. Silent. One thing to notice if you can is if it's joyful, pleasant to be in, silent, present moment awareness. If it's pleasant, then just stay here. It's a pleasure which allows further disappearing to happen. The piti sukha coming from the mind. And if you are aware of your breathing, make sure it's just the one breath, one the part of the breath happening now. Make sure it's a beautiful breath. Delightful breath. Once the breath appears delightful, then the mind is content to stay with it. It stays and stays. When you're content, time loses its power over you. Time is only there to make you do stuff, cause discontent. Contentment frees you from time. Just in this moment, a happy little meditator. I'm going to be quiet now. When I speak again, We'll be close to the end of the meditation.
getting close to the end of the meditation now. How do you feel inside? How peaceful are you? What worked or what didn't work in this meditation? So the last few minutes of the meditation is where we can see our insights. And how does your body feel? Sitting here comfortably. And how clear is your mind compared to when you began? So our hindrances get weaker mind becomes clearer and more easy to see deeply into things. And now I ask you to please observe three more breaths in out, in out, in out. At the end of the third out breath, open your eyes to finish this meditation after three more breaths. And smile. Excellent. Okay. So now is the break time. And we'll be back again in a couple of hours. Okay. Have a wonderful time. Bye.